so, 20th century. And uh, next class, we'll do the 21st. <clears throat> so again, get on our on-ramp uh, with the Renaissance to get uniform space and time. So <clears throat> Isaac Newton imagines that there's a giant grid permeating all of space and a giant clock ticking away throughout all of time. And that orients us. So imagine uh, we're here. It's so far to the moon. It's so far to Mars. Um, it's all in one. Before that, uh, there was the earthly realm. And if you went up too far, you were in a heavenly realm. And you couldn't get up there. So there's a different metaphysical realm. The idea is just all one continuity. And that's what <clears throat> Renaissance art is presenting us, that uniform space and time. And not only is there uniform space here permeated by a grid, which the artist maybe diagrams out and then paints over, and it just makes it look realistic, makes it look like it has depth. But Leonardo was so enamored of his uh, grid here, he decided not to paint over it. And then the client was real annoyed because he paid for the painting and he never got it because Leonardo hung on to it. But anyway, it also, this does something else. It freezes one moment in time. So everything is in the middle of the action. See this horse rearing up here. Everything is frozen at that one moment. But in so doing, it's conveying ongoing time. In other words, this is the middle of the action, which you imagine continues. And we see this notion manifest in uh, most famous, <coughs> yeah, the most famous perspective painting, Raphael's School of Athens. School of Athens. <coughs> With the 19th century, we get fields. And so <coughs> the Newtonian universe is seen as, it's called the clockwork universe. <coughs> All the if you use Newton's laws of motion, you can spot where all the planets are now, and you can say where they're going to be in six months. Uh, or where, if we take six weeks to get to Mars, you know where it's going to be in six weeks, uh, leaving now. <coughs> and <coughs> these laws are so precise that a little wobble in the orbit of Neptune says, eh, something disturbing it. That something should be a big and right there. Oh, there's Pluto. So that's how they discovered <coughs> further out planets. But in the 19th century, that's a plat clockwork mechanism, <coughs> excuse me, which could be modeled in these uh, Orreries. So here's the sun, here's the earth, the moon's going around the earth, here's um, Venus going around the sun. Um, becomes replaced by flux of fields. And as I said before, um, we see, we can see those fields by putting iron filings on a piece of paper over a magnet. Here's Maxwell's equations describing those fields. And maybe that's what is being manifest in a painting by Vincent van Gogh. So there are a lot of ways to look at the 20th century. And I'm going to pick a difficult one. We really do see, see uh, <coughs> mechanistic deterministic science does take off. But also, the world comes apart. People living through the uh, uh, first half of the 20th century really experience uh, a disintegration that they navigate pretty well. <clears throat> so let's start with 
where we are. So at the beginning of the 20th century, the Milky Way, which we didn't know that what, it, what it looked like, but we knew we were in a cluster of stars, was the universe. Milky Way and the universe was the same thing. Now, there were some cloudy things. They were called nebulae. And they said, well, that is dust clouds that are in the process of forming stars, but they're not there yet. 1922, um, Hubble with the 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson and later with the 200-inch telescope at Mount Palomar discovers, oh my God, those are galaxies, just like ours. And there's, what does Carl Sagan say? How many are there? Billions and billions. That's a famous Carl Sagan quote. So um, that's, you know, like suddenly we're in a much bigger universe than we had thought. Evolution. Evolution was disconcerting, uh, but it had sort of been observed. But the throughout, well, 1859 is the publication of Darwin's um, Origin of Species. And he does not include human beings in that. He does in his next book, Descent of Man. Uh, so it's controversial, religion, Christian religions don't like it, but it becomes pretty well accepted in science. But it's interpreted as progress, movement toward greater complexity. So life begins as a single cell and evolves toward the most complicated, quote unquote, the most complicated thing in the universe, which is what? What's, let me get this closer so my mic will pick up well. There you go. What did they like to say was the most complicated thing in the universe? More complicated than all the stars in the galaxy. The human brain is, I don't know, billions or trillions of whatever it is, neurons with numerous interconnections and you multiply all the fun. So there's a scene, evolution is interpreted as movement from simplicity to complexity. Not anymore. In the past 50 years, it's been re-understood as a random walk. It's not moving toward greater complexity. So there's a lot to discuss there. But um, um, it's disorienting. The idea that, OK, there's evolution. We're an animal, just like we share. 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees and 20% of our DNA with bananas. Uh, so we're just another animal. You have to grow a big brain. So that is disconcerting enough, but people pretty much got to accept that. But then to say, uh, we're not the result of a uh, teleological progress moving toward progress. It's a random walk. In 1905 and 1915, we got Einstein's special and then general relativity that there isn't any grid. There is no absolute space and time. It's in flux. Uh, the events that would be taking place in this being uh, in this time being ticked off by the universal clock are actually different for different observers who are in different motions, frames of motion. So that was disconcerting. Quantum theory, which I'll try to describe in two sentences, um, which is the most complicated thing there is, but 
says that how particles behave depends upon how we observe them. So whether the particle goes through one slit or two slits and how and, and the particle can be a wave or a particle depending upon how we observe them. And if they become waves, they can interfere with each other and produce these patterns when they hit the photo detector. So what actually happens depends upon how we observe it. And there's several, how does that work? There's several interpretations. One that's growing in popularity is called the many worlds theory, which is when the particle, if it's a particle, it goes through one slit, but the universe splits and its twin goes through the other slit. And the universe is splitting infinite number of times at every moment. So there are infinite parallel universes. Um, Starting with Shannon, 1949, he, uh, Shannon was working for, Claude Shannon, was working for uh, AT&T Bell Labs phone company. And <clears> he <throat> wanted to know, how much information can you get through a copper wire? Well, what's the first thing you have to answer? What is information? And how do you measure it? So that launches information theory. And again, uh, taking the most sophisticated <clears throat> theory of our time, uh, reducing it to one sentence, uh, information theory is being used to rethink all the rest of science. So where do we see information at the core of biology? What makes you the way you are? DNA. DNA. DNA is a computer code. It's four like uh, we do computers with binary zeros and ones on off. DNA uses four letters um, to make its code, and that can then build all of life. So 1914, 1918, we get World War One. And things are really doing pretty well up until World War I. We're seeing incredible, incredible progress, increase in wealth. And there was uh, a, what's called the Victorian sense of human perfectibility. The world is getting better. Europe is the vanguard of human progress. And it's um, going to lead the human race to greater and greater perfection. And then it falls into World War I. 20 million people die in the trenches. Another 20 million people die from the influenza that immediately follows it. Um, communism comes out of it, which kills 100 million people. And uh, World War II comes out of it, which kills another 20 million people. So that sort of undermined the notion of that we're headed toward human perfectibility. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe we're pretty inept. Um, very sophisticated people in science were in the Western world were religious. Darwin was not. Newton certainly was. Uh, he was totally religious. And as we move to the 20th century, we begin to challenge the notion of Christianity. So we, keep, we, we use the word religious. Uh, most people using it usually mean Christianity. There are other religions, like Taoism. Uh, and so 
Starting in 1893, Chicago World's Fair, there's uh, the Parliament of the World's Religions, and religious leaders from all over the world. Sri Ramakrishna, a great Hindu uh, mystic, sends one of his disciples. There are Buddhists there. Um, and all these people are interrelating and starting to learn about each other's religions. The West knew very little about Buddhism uh, up to that point. A bit, it started being translated in the um, early 1800s, uh, Eastern texts. But it really starts accelerating. And then um, the notion had always been, okay, God created the universe, and we were his special children. We're special. And now you are here. <laughs> it doesn't look very special. It's not even in the middle. Uh, so this started to unnerve people that you didn't have this central security where the spiritual systems of the earth had evolved toward our current religion. Rather, our current religion is just one of many that will probably become something different. The uh, suffragette movement, women becoming the equal of men. So one of the things I'm uh, dealing with in my mother's memoir, which ends when she leaves high school, but she goes to Barnard, and which is just part of the women's school at Columbia. Women were not allowed to go to Columbia College. They went to Barnard. And they could take Columbia courses. And uh, what was the story at Harvard? Anybody? Well, it's the it's part of Columbia, but it was like the way that women could be part of the school because they weren't accepting women, right? Harvard, he went to Radcliffe. Oh, because of Harvard. So Radcliffe was the women's school at Harvard. And um, and you took Harvard courses. Radcliffe didn't have any of their own courses. But you didn't go to Harvard, you went to Radcliffe. And you didn't go to Columbia, you went to. And actually, when I went to Penn, um, women went to the College for Women at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, men went to the college, women went to the College for Women. They had a different dorm, but other than that, same classes. Um, but anyway, women didn't, were not allowed to go to Columbia Law School. So one of my mother's classmates said, wait a minute, I see something in this document here that implies we should be able to go. So uh, my mother and five other women applied to and were admitted to Columbia Law School. So she was the first among the first women to go to Columbia Law. So it wasn't just there were less women in the legal profession. Women weren't allowed to go to most law schools. Uh, <clears throat> Harvard School of Architecture started taking women in 1941. Uh, before that, women didn't go to Harvard. Couldn't go to Harvard, architecture. So all that starts to end, and um, 19, I think it's around 1920, women get the vote. Um, breakdown of class, rise of entrepreneurship. So before the 20th century, in many societies, you held higher status by being born uh, in an aristocratic class, born into the aristocracy. But in the early 20th century, we, well, late 19th, early 20th century, we see the launching of these new industries, oil, Rockefeller, rubber, uh, Goodyear, um, automobiles, Henry Ford, Steel, Carnegie, uh, etc. And these people don't typically do not come from wealthy backgrounds. They become 
the richest and most powerful people in the society, but through entrepreneurship. So we have a breakdown of class and a rise of entrepreneurship. And then we have uh, emergence of a working class, which becomes quite, eventually becomes quite comfortable compared to subsistence farming. So I don't remember what year it was, but Henry Ford, in one stroke, did something that totally changed the structure of society. He was already making the Model T, but then he did something. Anybody know what that is? In one day. The factory. Right? He had the factory. But it was like the lines. He had, that, was, that was already going. It was just a policy. He was making Model Ts. Did he have a woman in one day, he cut the cost of the car in half and doubled the wages of his workers. That meant that his workers could afford a car. So suddenly, he increased his potential market tenfold. So instead of just rich people being able to afford a car, everybody who was working could afford a car. And that changed everything. And it was very controversial. Everybody said, this will ruin society. All other businesses will have to do the same thing. Business will collapse. They just launched the modern era in one shot. So there's a highly, disrupt a highly disruptive situation. A collapse of our scientific center, you're no longer the center of the universe. A collapse of religion, ours is no longer the religion, it's just one religion. A um, launch of industrialization with affluent workers. Uh, women becoming metaphysical equals of men uh, being educated, entering professions, and voting. Uh, before that, Women didn't vote because they, their fragile brains couldn't handle it. Women didn't go to college because the uterus might collapse from the stress of the education. Uh, so uh, the idea that women, uh, it's interesting, if you look at putting aside transgender, if you look at the woman's, current woman's record for the mile. It's probably faster than the fastest man 100 years ago. So um, uh, women, you know, women run the marathon with no problem. <laughs> There's actually some There we go. Okay, I'm not going to find what I'm looking for, but we'll look at this. So, <clears throat> this is um, Frank Lloyd Wright's Roby House. <clears throat> it's an icon of modern architecture. 1909, around the same time as Picasso's Cubism. And Wright introduces what's called the open plan. So, instead of the key rooms being in boxes like we see here, uh, the main rooms flow one into another in an open space, open, open plan. And this is reflective of the changing social structure of the family. So has everybody seen at least a couple of modern family episodes? 
Okay, it's recommended. <laughs> so there's an old guy who's divorced, has a sex bombshell of a younger wife. His children are grown up. The daughter is married to a real estate broker. They have three kids. They're the sort of straight family. The son is gay, married to a gay guy. They have an adopted Vietnamese daughter. Um, the Latin American sex bombshell brought into the marriage with her, her son from a previous marriage, and then they have a, their own kid. So, and they all live in the same neighborhood. So it's a zoo. It, it's like the idea of mother, father, two and a half children, I used to like to joke, um, is long gone, and it's just totally a zoo. And so Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture, instead of having boxes that put people in according to who they are, everybody's in flux. And um, so the architecture is in flux. In literature, we can take as our key example, uh, James Joyce, <clears throat> and two of his novels are Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake. He published three novels, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, and these two. In Ulysses, it follows one day in the life of Bloom, and what is described is his stream of consciousness. In other words, there's not an objective God's eye view that says, now he's going to the pub, now he's going down the street, we can see him. But rather, you see what he sees or what he's thinking. And he might suddenly be remembering when he first met his wife 10 years ago. Uh, and so we're jumping all around in space and time due to um, the lack of a uniform space and time where we can position ourselves for a God's eye point of view and instead we get stream of consciousness. In Finnegan's Wake, all the archetypal structures that used to be in the external world, the religion, the social structure, the mythologies, become internalized into one's consciousness. So the structure of Finnegan's Wake in levels are family, historical, legendary, mythological, capitalistic, etc. And then the characters, um, Henry Earwicker, here comes everybody, Maggie, etc. Then we go through the Viconian cycles of history. History goes animism, aristocracy, democracy, anarchy, everything collapses and you go back to animism again. Uh, then we've got the books of the Bible. And so all of this intersecting structure is um, um, internalized into the characters rather than being in the external world. Now, when we go to the Metropolitan Museum, the 19th, late 19th century paintings, Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, used to be segregated from the French academic paintings. And now they're a bit mixed together, which is really terrific. And so this painting is there. So this is a French academic painting from the late 1800s, the storm. So we have this young lover is caught in the storm, nymphs running. Um, and this is the world that's rejected by this emerging modernism, which we see in Monet's Rouen Cathedral. So 
<coughs> very deliberately, Rouen, uh, Monet says, I'm, who knows what the cathedral is? We never see it. What we see is the light coming from it. And the light coming from it is always different. So he sets up, he rents a room across from the cathedral, and he starts a dozen canvases. And depending upon the light, uh, sunset, very red yellow, um, overcast day, no sun, very blue, etc., uh, etc., et and um, fog, etc., etc., and makes all these paintings. This idea is carried further in Cubism where rather than saying there's a figure there, I am here, it's therefore in a perspective space, rather we're in motion, the figure's in motion, there is no uniform space to see it in, and so Picasso's and Brock's early cubism is as though you're looking at the figure in a shattered mirror. And a bit later, um, Salvador Dali does The Persistence of Memory. And there's lots of symbolic stuff going on here, but what's the easiest, most obvious thing that he's saying? Time is not rigid, it's in flux. The watches are melting. Right. Pretty hard to have rigid time when your watch is melting. And then, here's an interesting thought. Here is a <clears throat> Baroque crucifixion. Now here we are, 1954, Salvador Dali doing a crucifixion, and it's kind of modernized, but how are we to regard Christianity? How are we to regard the crucifixion? Did it actually happen? And if it did, doesn't that demean the story? In other words, if the crucifixion story is a description of something that actually happened, okay, somebody got nailed to a cross. Um, but if it's symbolic, it's about the potential for, in me, a death to my secular self and the potential of the birth of a spiritual self. So if that's what the crucifixion means, then it's that particular story is an example of something that could have universal meaning. And so here's a Mondrian. Here's the vertical of life and the horizontal of death. So Mondrian is recasting the crucifixion as a universal symbolism rather than a story about one culture in the Middle East. And then finally, uh, we get a challenge to the hierarchical notion of art. So here is a Jackson Pollock, 1950. Famous drip painting. So here's our Jackson Pollock. Is it really that revolutionary? Is it really that different from a Monet Impressionist painting. They're both both very painterly. 
This is how paintings are supposed to look. They're kind of have browns in them, and you could put up a Rembrandt. There's lots of browns, layers of varnish in a Rembrandt. What am I going to show you next? Video. That doesn't look like a painting. <laughs> that doesn't look painterly. Pardon? Right, to say Andy Warhol's soup can. So the idea of an engagement with our popular culture. Now, I'm going to show you something interesting in a minute. So let's jump into the 60s. I was a little bit notorious at that time. Uh, and here is a, a little jump that's made. So this is a popular TV sitcom of the 50s, Father Knows Best. Very patriarchal. I mean, he's not abusive or anything, but the idea being, uh, you know, the father is the center of the family. One of the uh, movies announcing the emergence of the 60s is Easy Rider with uh, Fonda and what's his name? I can't remember. Um, how many people, anybody seen the movie? I saw bits and pieces in a class I took. Okay, good. So, you know, um, unfortunately, we wouldn't agree. I always think Pratt faculty should make a list of 10 movies that everybody should see. So that way we can talk about them. Uh, and the problem is no two faculty members would agree. So, But that would be on my list. It's not, not that it's a great movie. It's just an icon of thinking of a particular moment. So everybody had Che Guevara posters up in their dorm rooms. And it was kind of a turn against the Marxism of Mao, his little red book, even of Sartre, his existential Marxism. Pol Pot killed one third of the population of Cambodia. Then there was a thought, well, maybe you could have a revolution without this. So, Without Marx or Jesus was a very popular book. Uh, a <laughs> good friend of mine, Abby Hoffman, was a charismatic uh, character proposing that. It was a time of challenging authority. So here is Mario Savio and the free speech movement at Berkeley. Here is and the war march. In the war march, here is Mark Rudd at Columbia University. Pratt was on strike. This is 1968. And uh, uh, Pratt's strike was somewhat, we didn't get as much press, but this is a bit deeper. And the students went to one of the cool professors and said, uh, in 1968, who should we get? Who's interesting out there? Who should we get? And he said, John Lobel. So that's how I got hired. I came in 69. Um, supposed to keep the revolutionaries happy. Uh, there was this moment of after the pill and before herpes and AIDS, everybody got in a big pot because um, you didn't have anything to worry about. The feminist movement. So um, Betty Friedan's the feminine mystique kind of launched it and it then very, got very radical, Kate Millett, uh, et cetera. And as things as um, just medical care, the idea that maybe you'd want a woman doctor if you're a woman. Um, 
which is pretty difficult if women can't go to medical school. Now is launched. We have the emergence of what's called New Age. Uh, and kind of associate that with, with meditation. So uh, a wonderful book by a woman named Marilyn Ferguson, The Aquarian Conspiracy, about the emergence of a new kind of take on reality, a sensitivity to the energies that flow through us toward um, a flowing personality, interest in Buddhism, meditation, yoga, and you did it at Esalen. So Esalen's still there. It's on the cliffs over the Pacific Ocean uh, in Big Sur, just about the most beautiful spot on the planet. Uh, uh, for forwarding these ideas. LSD, so this is Ken Kesey and his Merry Pranksters, uh, painted a bus, drove around the country. <clears throat> Tom Wolfe, the straightest, just died, the straightest guy <laughs> ever was, hung out with them and wrote a book about it, the electric Kool-Aid acid test, and then East Totem West made these posters the most famous posters were for rock concerts at um, Fillmore. Uh, yeah. I think my favorite wasn't them. There were so many like great like, posters, like so screen posters around this era that just I think it might have been for Charles Gambino, Don Glover, this like. Say again slowly. It might have been this person who did like rock concert posters during this era, and he's like really famous for it. He just like came out, he like helped this artist in the past like three years with their posters for a tour. I think it might have been Donald Glover for Travel cool. you know. Yeah, I don't know who did these, but I, I bought a whole collection of them, figuring <clears throat> maybe they'd be valuable someday. and. Basically, they're still selling for the same price, so they're not valuable. Well, there was like this one guy that had like, they were like iconic silk screen posters from the 70s. Yeah, mine are just stop. print. Mine are not hand silk screen. Oh. Uh, a lot of music. Uh, maybe the doors are the most representative of this acid generation. And then the space program was immensely important for a lot of reasons, but oh my God, there it is. They go out to the moon, turn around and look back. <laughs> uh, and so what's, what's this called? Two things, the big blue marble and Spaceship Earth. Hey, it's small. <laughs> we better manage it. And that launches the ecology movement. So this is the first Earth Day. And the whole Earth catalog. I happen to have the first one. I have to look up if that's funny. Flower Children, um, Summer of Love, everybody went to San Francisco and took their clothes off. And two years later, the Rolling Stones had a concert at Altamont in California. Ha didn't know what they were doing, hired the Hells Angels for security, and somebody got killed. So everybody, it was a real downer. Everybody came down. This is an interesting group in England. So uh, England was very socialist at the time. And the largest architectural office was the London County Council, which built public housing. 
which is most of what they built. So you, you go to school, it's cool, you have interesting professors, you work on interesting projects, and you get out and spend the rest of your career doing this. So this group said, well, maybe not. Let's launch a magazine. And they launched it in comic book format, comic book printing, comic book size, using this 1930s Flash Gordon aesthetic, and did stuff like this. So this is called Plug-in City. And they said, well, what is the city? Well, you have a grid. So in the streets is a grid. There's cars on the surface. And a subway right outside our window running under that street. Subways, water mains, sewers, electric lines, cable. What if we make that grid three-dimensional? And what if we make core of our building a wraparound parking garage? And then our apartment units plug in. So you can trade in your apartment and get a new one. There's an apartment being delivered. So it's called Plug-in City. So there's a few dozen of these joints. If you put Lobel 60s, you can see my lecture on this. You look at a dozen of these in, on YouTube. And of course, our key figure is Andy Warhol. And we use the term digital native. So if you're launching a, well, I just finished reading or listening to a book called Merchants of Truth by Jill Abramson, who's the former chief editor of the New York Times. And it's a story in the past 20 years of the Washington Post, the New York Times, BuzzFeed, and Vice. And but BuzzFeed and Vice are two online nerve news services, and the Times and the Post are two legacy print news services. The Washington Post and New York Times had a very rough time of it moving into digital because it was print people trying to figure out what to put online. BuzzFeed and Vice was launched by digital natives, people who grew up that way. <laughs> uh, so, like, I did I ever ask you guys, maybe it was another class, does anybody here ever have a course in word processing? No, you're born knowing how to do it. <laughs> Uh, 30 years ago, Pratt had a whole huge classroom with rows and rows of computers teaching word processing. <laughs> Everybody knows how to do word processing. So a digital native is one who just, you know, they grew up with it. It's like you don't have to tell a kid how to use a remote control on a TV. So Andy Warhol was a popular culture native. He didn't say, let's look at popular culture and see how we can incorporate that in our art. He just was. He grew that, you know, that's what he grew up in. Now, <clears throat> when I talk about this elsewhere, I look for the slides and I couldn't find them uh, this afternoon. But here is a Cezanne still life, apples and oranges and pears. If you go to a French grocery store, it's going to be a little corner store, 1895. This is what it looked like. If you go, now, you go to art school in the 50s, and you, they put oranges and apples on the table, and you paint a still life. Well, you're painting the way apples look in the store 50 years earlier. This is what a store looks like in 1950 or 1960. It's got neon lights and, you know, 
It looks like this. It's got canned soup and piles of Brillo boxes. So Andy Warhol is painting the same thing Cezanne is painting, namely the store that he sees rather than the store that somebody saw 100 years ago. OK, do we know everybody? Who's that? Who's that? And who's that? All right. So those are the three, three biggest icons of Elvis, um, Elizabeth Taylor. And Andy Warhol's product was as much himself as his art. So here's Andy with Viva and Ultraviolet. Ultraviolet just died. She was a good friend. Uh, and 1968. And actually, <clears throat> he launched um, the Super called Andy Warhol Superstars. Uh, they launched about three years early at a big show at the University of Pennsylvania. My favorite, uh, though, is Klaus Oldenburg. He's still alive. And uh, he would make, for example, uh, his giant paper clip. So I was doing stuff at that time, uh, environmental art. So this is a, uh, I took a gallery and put a three foot grid in electrical tape on the floor diagonally and put these L-shaped panels up. And so you're in this maze, totally transformed the experience of the space. Um, and after I did this, I became the curator of the uh, Architecture Week events. This is done at the Architecture Week. So one of the shows I did was dial -a -pum. So we got 10 phone lines and answering machines. Now, today, your answering machine is digital. You don't have one. It's part of your phone service. But in those days, the answering machine was a box with tape in it. So if you called the movie theater, uh, you'd come in and there's a loop tape playing at 245 is, and you have to wait for the loop tape to go all in theater three, play, you have to wait for it to go all the way around to the beginning to then hear what time the movie you wanted to see. Well, we got uh, 10 of those machines. John Giorno then put recorded poetry on the tapes by major poets. William Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg, John Giorno, Taylor Mead. Uh, most of these were pretty well known figures. And it was literally written up in just about every publication in the world. We got. Um, a uh, quarter of a page in the New York Times, and then uh, Junior and Senior Scholastic Magazine uh, published it. So then, oh, and these people are reading their own poems. So English teachers all over the world assign their kids to call in to hear Allen Ginsberg reading his poetry. So uh, I had to raise a thousand a month to pay the phone bills today. We could have a 970 number and they'd pay us, but uh, we could put it all online. But after several months, we got our millionth phone call. The league said, OK, you made your point. Shut it down. <laughs> we were up for about three months. It was real hoof. But it was weaving this invisible net around the world. So the figure I like to look to as the inspiration for this is um, Marcel Duchamp. And uh, it's sort of discuss it. In my book, I credit Duchamp with launching the 21st century, even though, so we sort of like to say, Pablo Picasso with Les Dames d'Avignon, 1907, launches the 20th century. 
uh, I like to say 10 years later, Duchamp launched the 21st century. And so, yeah, is he a 20th century figure or a 21st century figure? So Duchamp began his career by hanging out in French art circles and working in various post-impressionist styles. Not very distinguished. And then in uh, 1912, he does New Descending a Staircase 2. And it's a huge sensation. He submits it to the Salon des Independents in Paris. Now what happened was the, the art was controlled by the government. I mean, in France. You had to go to America for freedom. And you needed a permit to open a gallery. And the gallery uh, selected what they would and would not show. So they wouldn't show the Impressionists. So they eventually were able to launch their own gallery, the Salon des Independents. And so Duchamp takes New Descending a Staircase, and it's sort of a combination of uh, Cubism and Italian Futurism. There's that famous Dachshund dog with its feet moving. Everybody know that Futurist painting? The most archetypal famous Futurist painting is Cute little dachshund. See if we can get it bigger. There we go. Oh. So it's capturing time. Let's see what year that is. Nineteen twelve. Oh, so uh, Pichon was not coming off as somebody else. Um, we're going to finish up, so I'll skip a bathroom break. Just got a little bit to go. So he submits it, and he submits it, and the curator suggests that he change its name. So he refuses. He put it in a taxi and went home. <laughs> so then, uh, in 1913, he's in America. He submits it to a famous art show at the Armory. An art critic in the New York Times described it as an explosion in a shingle factory. So then, 1970, the so Society of Independent Artists in New York announces an exhibition that would show all work submitted. We're going to not do what those cowardly French are doing and turn stuff down. We'll take everything. So Duchamp was on the board of the gallery. He immediately left. And he went to a plumbing supply on Fifth Avenue and 8th Street, which is obviously not there anymore, and buys a urinal. <laughs> and he signs it R. Mutt, 1917, and submits it. Now the gallery doesn't know what to do. They can't refuse it because they said they'd accept everything, but they don't want to exhibit because they'll be ridiculed. So they exhibit, they put it in the exhibit, but behind a curtain. <laughs> Who made so, the exhibit? Pardon? Who made the exhibit? You said he did? Or the exhibit was the Society of Independent Artists. It was modern, New York modern artists. Oh, okay. They're trying to support the modern artists who are not being supported by the establishment. But they didn't realize it could get that far out. So then, the 
they exhibit it, but it's behind a curtain. And now we have one of the most iconic, important works of modern art, and they threw it away. That <laughs> somebody thought it was uh, plumbing, you know, some urinal had been ripped out of the men's room. They put a new one in, they threw it away. So they have it in various places, including the best uh, Duchamp collection is in the Philadelphia Museum. I'll show you that in a minute. But they, uh, it's a reproduction. Now, two stupid things were said about this. One of them, well, look at the aesthetic quality of the sensuous curves. The other stupid thing was, well, Americans are practical, and plumbing is the American art. So it's appropriate that this would be American, although he's French, he's French-American. But it's got nothing to do with plumbing or, because he makes, uh, he calls these ready-mades, and he has others. This one's in the Museum of Modern Art. So it's, it's not there the last time I was there, but occasionally you see this hanging on a little wire in, the, in MoMA. It's just a snow shovel. Went to a hardware store and bought a snow shovel. Then, 19, late 40s, he gives up art and spends the rest of his 20 years of his life playing chess, not making art. But it turns out that whole time he was working on a secret piece. And uh, from 1946 to 1966, for 20 years. And he donates it to the uh, Deschamps Collection at Philadelphia Museum of Art. And it opens in 1969. You walk into this little room. It's about this big on four sides. A wooden door. And you lean up against it. Right here are two eye holes. And you, anybody seen it? And you look in there and there's a mannequin, which I'm not showing you all of. Um, and that's it. So what are we to make that of that? And there's a little, this is a mannequin holding a lamp. There's a little fountain of waterfall running here, work, work by lights. That's so this it. is like an entire setup. It's not like a picture, it's like a setup. This or? is molded. Yes. It's like a real person got cast. It's a room. It's a, well, you, this is all you can see. This, this obliterates a lot. You can't see her head. Like, if you could move over, you could see but her it's head. it's like a room, and, like, that's the mannequin, and, like, that's real, like... So There's like two rooms. Space. Yeah, it's a three-way space. That's what I'm asking. Where was it? Like, there's actually grass. Yeah. There's this room, and then there's another room yeah. behind this door. All you can... But you're very limited in what you see, because you can't get an angle. Your eyes are locked to these two holes. And so, this is all... Mostly modeled. Maybe some of this is picture. But this is like a real person got cast in plastic. So what are we to make of that? So, with the 20th century, the light of 20th century, <clears throat> I think... Art is no longer an object, a work of art, a thing. Rather, an artist has an intention. They create something, usually requiring an aesthetic sense, but not always. It doesn't require any skill to buy a snow shovel. An audience experiences it, sometimes with consternation. Does anybody know the most famous oh, I'm trying to think of his name. Name something in my mind. Anyway, an artist experiences sometimes with consternation. Now, the work, urinal, snow shovel. Lay down Mozart Avignon. Yeah, yeah, it's good. 
the initial response of the audience. Subsequent responses. You know, you see it the first time, maybe, ah, next time I'm down, fall it off here, I'll go look at that again. Responses of subsequent audiences. So, The Rite of Spring by Stravinsky caused a riot the first time it was played. Next time it was played, it was just another piece of music. So subsequent audiences had different reactions. The ongoing evaluations, people talk about it, think about it, rethink it, it gets in textbooks, reverberate through the decades. Duchamp's point was art is not just the something, usually requiring craft in an aesthetic sense, but this entire process. We can no longer separate the artist, the audience, and the work of art. It's all one continuity. So that's an argument for later, latter 20th century art.